don't know about you guys, but I am really enjoying the series that uh, God has us on. And I don't know how long it's going to take to, to finish it. I just know that God is in the process of establishing us. I think our heart cry needs to be the last song that we sing. Lord, give me what it takes to stay. I'm tired of wandering off. I'm tired of getting caught up in the things of this world. I want to walk with you. And that needs to be the heart cry of every true believer. And I believe it's what separates what we call the church from the remnant. The remnant says, I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to reject everything else. And we have been studying paths to walk in or paths to dwell in. And it, it's interesting when, when I was just kind of thinking about this this morning, we, we, spent ten, we spent seven sessions dealing just with God because God is the author of salvation and seven is in his plan. We find it in the menorah. The, there's, there's seven steps or seven feasts that work out the plan and salvation of God for mankind. We began man on the eighth lesson because only through what God has done can man have a new beginning. It is the number of new beginnings. This morning is the ninth one, and actually, I was planning on covering a lot of subjects with this one, but God says, no, you're going to be stuck on fruit, because there's so much in understanding fruit in the Word that uh, I've never, some of the things I'm going to cover this morning, guys, I have never, ever heard another minister ever cover, and I cannot say it's because Mike Lake got in there and dug and, and ferreted out all these interesting things. It's because the Holy Spirit spoke. He's the one that's supposed to lead us into all truth. And I would rather listen to five minutes of the Holy Spirit than a thousand hours of a theologian that didn't hear from God. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to, back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Last week we uh, dealt with how that man was created in the image of God and all that that had established. Now, I don't want to cover some of the same territory that we already covered before. I mean, know that you can go back to Genesis 1, 2, 3 and preach a million sermons and never really cover the same thing the same way. Uh, in the End of Day Spiritual Warfare series, I detailed how that it was the fall of Lucifer that brought chaos to planet Earth. And that God's response to that was he began to utter commands to his creation. And in the commands of God is an anointing to turn chaos back into divine order. And I don't want to uh, really kind of go back over all those things again, but we need to understand the commandments of God. The commands of God bring order, authority, purpose, and provision to God's creation. Isn't it any wonder why Satan so hates the commandments of God and why he has jaundiced or made prejudice to the church against the commandments of God? By doing so, he took the only thing that, that allowed us to move out of chaos into divine order. And isn't any wonder why the church is the epitome of chaos today. It really is. Most churches, what they call activities, are simply them running after chaos or responding to chaos. If you really think about it, it's just responding to chaos. When you begin walking with God, the chaos begins to cease in a divine order. See, that's where the blessings really are, is when divine order takes a hold, you're not, you're not having to run to put out all the fires. Part of the blessing is there aren't any fires. Hmm. But see, if you, if you have that, then you, you lose the drama queens. The people that just live for drama and, and, and the thrill of turmoil, that doesn't belong in the kingdom. So if you have a drama queen in the church, they're not acting by commands, they're acting out of the chaos. And where does the chaos come from? The Bible says where there's chaos, there's every evil work. Just want to put that one out there, let you just see la ponder on that one for a little while. Now the first commandments given to man was not about cultivating or even keeping the garden. If you go back to Genesis, that wasn't where the commands began. The first commandments are more foundational the first commandments that God gave us are both to man's existence and to his purpose. Did you know that you can cultivate and not have any purpose? There are people that, are, that can, can you know, kind of take authority and kind of do things, but yet they're still wandering for purpose. Well, here years ago, one of the, one of the biggest sellers that, that transcended the, the, sec, the, the religious or the sacred market that went into the, the public market was man's, uh, man's search for significance, man's search for who am I, my purpose. 
we're going to see this morning that your purpose is connected to who God created you to be and in responding to those commands of God. And so the very first ones are not keep the garden, to cultivate the garden. We find it in Genesis 1.28. And God blessed them and said unto them. Now prior to this, everything that God has said in the book, in chapter 1, every single one of them were a command. They were a command to set something in motion. Even when God talked with himself, if you will, the God, God took counsel and said, let us make man in our own image. That's a command. God was formulating what he was going to do, and he began to speak the commands, and then he carried out his own commands. And so with, with that in mind, we need to understand that chapter 28 is not statements of fact. They are commands that man needs to respond to. And when you receive them as a command, there is an anointing to carry out those commands in the kingdom. That's part of what the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Even the command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The reason that you can do that is the Holy Spirit convicts you. Then the Holy Spirit empowers you to respond to that command. And when you activate that command, salvation takes a hold. And that's the way all of God's word works. Same here. God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful. How I many know that's a command? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, most people read this and God said unto them, have kids, have kids, have lots of kids. Isn't that really... I've heard preachers preach it that way. Therefore, every family should have 12, 14, 15 kids. Not necessarily. There's only so much some mamas can bear. You've got to find out exactly where you're at and what God wants you to have. I think sometimes we have some because we've been programmed by the world. Some mamas that were supposed to have 12 kids have two. And there are some mamas that really needed two or three kids that had 12. They're the ones with their hair frazzled and sticking out in every direction. But that's the part of that is, yes, God wants us to multiply. And I mean, I can get into the, well, let me, let me get into this. Satan's kingdom used to be on the earth. When he fell, he was thrown down to where his throne was. He tried to exalt his throne up into the heavens, equal with God's, and God threw him back where his throne was, planet earth. Even where God said, replenish the earth, that means to fill it back up. And so we need to realize that we are actually on earth 2.1. It was 2.0 when Adam came here. Then after the flood, it was 2.1. And God created in the midst of this, of this planet where Satan's throne is, Pergamos. God created a patch of ground and said, it's off limits. I give it to man. God took back a portion of it and gave him authority. And with that authority, he said, as you multiply, how many know that if man hadn't sinned and they started multiplying, how many know the Garden Eden wouldn't have been big enough to hold them for a while? You know, it, it, it would have to have expanded. And as it expanded, they would continue to take authority. They would have continued to keep the garden. And, and it's like a city that can start small. How many know one time Springfield was small? St. Louis was small. New York was small. But as the people grew, the boundaries of that began to expand. The Garden of Eden could have done the same thing. Now, this is in my notes. This is just interesting stuff. And as it did, the Garden of Eden would eventually have expanded over the entire planet, leaving no room for Lucifer. That's one of the reasons that he came and nipped it at the bud, because he knew that if he could get them to fall before they reproduced... Every seed produces after its own kind. Fallen man produces fallen man. And thus it would, then he took that authority over the garden and then added it to the authority he had around the rest of the planet. And even the Apostle Paul calls him the God of this world, little g. It was man's job to root him out, to push him out. So that, that's part of the thing of to, to take authority, everything in it to take authority. But I want to look deeper, and this morning I want to just zero in on be fruitful. Because unless you be fruitful, 
none of the rest of it will fall into place. You cannot take dominion without being fruitful. Because being fruitful begins to manifest some things in your life that, how many know that the joy of the Lord is our strength and you cannot have joy if you're not fruitful? You cannot set in a life that has meant nothing, done nothing, and have joy in it. Unless you're on an opiate or something, okay? <laughs> it's impossible. And so we're going to see throughout the Word of God that fruitfulness is connected with joy, it's connected with fulfillment, it's connected with purpose and meaning and why am I here. The word fruitful in the Hebrew is para, which means to, be, uh, to bear fruit, to be fruitful, to branch off, which I thought was very interesting, to cause, to bear fruit, to show fruitfulness. And so God is saying, listen, I've placed things within you that I want to begin bearing fruit in your life. And in bearing fruit, that's that, you see the 28, it, it's, it's like, even, even still when you're dealing with Windows on a computer, there's still a DOS level functioning there. There's a, there's a basic kernel that without that kernel of commands, nothing is possible on that computer. And even before take authority and guard, God begins to establish it this way. I have placed things within you that as you walk with me, it begins to bear fruit. And when it begins to bear fruit, then you can multiply, and then you can begin filling the earth full of that fruitfulness. And when you do, you can take dominion. Because what bears fruit in your life either allows you to take dominion for the kingdom or allows another kingdom to take dominion over you. You are the great fruit bearer. You are spiritual ground that God can either sow into or Lucifer can sow into. And the, the life that you're living now is a result of of the seed that has been sown in you. As people say, well, are we not a product of our environment? Not necessarily. I have known people that have come out of horrific environments that became great people, that good-hearted people. The difference was the good-hearted people, the, the ones that came out of terrible things and, and became wonderful is because they allowed God into their life that they were able to break up the fallow ground and get rid of the old seed and to begin to allow God to sow fresh seed. Guys, we need to understand that the very first commandment that we can ever walk in from God is to live fruitful lives. This is referring to both being productive with our lives to make them count for something good. It's in this that as we begin to move in it, we get self-worth and joy because it's connected to us spiritually, emotionally, and even in physical productivity. Now I want to give a side note. Can I do that here real quick? There was the greatest error in American history, or era, and how many know that we're, we're in a downcline era right now? that was set in motion on purpose. I'm going to get into some of this next week. It was something called progressivism, and they took over a lot of areas to sow seed. But the greatest era in American history was when we were a producing nation. America no longer produces. We used to be the food basket of the world. We aren't anymore. Did you know that Russia produces more wheat than America? We don't even produce more cars. Just think of this. Japan doesn't have near the real estate as America does. But what amazes me, and, and Mary and I, it's kind of hard to wrap our heads around it, that half the population of America live on these little islands called the Japanese islands. Half the population. But out of that little island, more cars come and you can shake a stick at. They produce more. 
in the in the 70s and the 80s as a result of what was sown into the American educational system and in the political system we became a consumer nation how many have come to realize that the ability to consume only brings transient joy it you you get you get a whoo from it for about 15 20 minutes 30 minutes after you get it if it's really a good good fancy doodle wop you get maybe a week's worth of joy out of it but that that fades true joy and true meaning of life can never be about what you own it's about what you produce and america at one time was a producing nation. Having the freedom to be fruitful is the American dream. We've heard, well, the American dream is having a car. The American dream is having your own home. That is a byproduct of the American dream. It is not the American dream. The American dream is to walk a life before God that is perfect, that causes me to produce. And I am not restricted by a government around me with men that are not walking with God that try to restrict and suppress that creativity that God gave me. And in, in, in societies that are socialistic, they suppress the creativity of man. If you could come up with an idea that would bless the world and make you rich so that you could go ahead and do anything that you wanted to do for God, how many know that that is a motivation to do it? Now, if I came to you and said, now I want you to produce the same thing, I wanted to make millions of dollars so that I could give it to a million people that didn't do anything but sit there and then you get your little portion and I hold a gun to your head, how many are going to feel real creative? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. That's why socialism doesn't work. These things don't work. <sighs> Guys, we also need to realize that America is on a downward spiral since we've become a consumer nation, and now we are obsessed with entitlements instead of productivity. Entitlements are the opium of socialism and destroy man's freedom to become fruitful. I don't have to do nothing that I get. Well, how are the ones getting give to you? Somebody along the line better be fruitful. If they can't, then there's simply suppression and taking everything from everybody and then divvying out a little bit to everybody else where the guys in the top have the, the lion's share. And it has no bearing on what you're able to produce. That's why people can set their whole lives and live on welfare, guys. Now, there's some people that need that, isn't there? There's some people that are injured or whatever. They, they need that assistance, and there's no way for them to lift themselves out of it. But a good majority of people that are on welfare, their potential will remain forever untapped. They are addicted to a system that suppresses them when really when people are walking with God, that's when you get, that's when you get what, what the world calls a self-made man. That's a man with no education. I mean, there, guys, there used to be in America, guys with third grade educations became multimillionaires. Do you realize that? They didn't go to college and go into debt being filled with the world's seed, and yet they were able to produce things that were, were unfathomable that the educated man couldn't figure out because God takes the simple things of the world to, to show up every wise man on the planet. But when you do it the world's way, it's, it stifles, it suppresses. What great gifts, by the ways that we have done things in America, we ought to reward people if you're on welfare. We ought to reward you and make a way of you bettering yourself and releasing the talents that God placed within you. That's the best thing to do because then not only can that man become fruitful so that he can begin giving to a system to help those who need, he becomes an inspiration and then his life begins to benefit all those around him because he's bearing fruit. Just, just a thought. And in that, he becomes happy. You know, we have more and more kids that are raised in what we would call affluent or privileged lives? How many of them get caught up in drugs and 
desperation and just all these different things. Why? Because they don't believe that they have got to produce anything. And because, even though they have everything, they produce nothing and they have despair. And let me add this one. What you're able to produce in your life, nobody can take away. Because you could lose it all today and you'll immediately begin rebuilding it and producing it again tomorrow. Because it's not exter internal thing, or it's external things, it's internal. It's that what God has placed within you. I don't know about you, but that, that is, that's comforting to me. That even though there's ups and downs, God has placed within me what I need to be a blessing. That's why God told Abraham, I will bless you and make you a blessing. Think about that. I create blessing where I go so that other people can be inspired to loose the blessing within them. So wrapped up in this first command is a major source of happiness, joy, fulfillment, and purpose for each man and woman. You are placed on this planet to become a conduit for the creativity of God to flow. The Bible says God will give you witty inventions. There was a time that most of the gadgets that we have, most of the technology that we have was birthed out of America. Because we Christians had the freedom to allow God to give them witty inventions. The only probably gadget that you have in your household that was not birthed out of America is called a, a microwave and it was birthed out of Nazism. It was a Nazi device that even the Russians said it kills everything you put in it and it destroys any food worth. And so they gave it to America and said, why don't you go play with it? Russia is kind of, hard, it's kind of a hard place to find a microwave. Did you know that? It's okay to heat water, but don't put food in it because it'll kill every enzyme. It will molecularly destroy any food that you put in it. But see, that didn't come out of creativity. That came out of negative creativity in a nation born in the concept of Nazism. Guys, when we come in line with that command, we not only are a blessing, we become a blessing to those around us. How many want to be a blessing to those around you? It's time to learn to function in that productivity. We need to understand, too, the blessing of fruitfulness goes beyond man. I'm going to tie... How many know that it's really neat when you can tie the New Testament to something in the Old Let's go to John chapter 15. I'm going to teach you a couple things this morning. I want to be fruitful. How about you? Fruitful for the kingdom. I'm tired of bearing fruit for the devil. I want to have fruit for the kingdom. And I'm going to read verses 4 and 5 and then 7 and 8. Uh, John 15, verses 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abideth in the vine. No, uh, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If we abide, if we abide, if we abide, if we abide, ye bear fruit. Then jumping on down to verse 7, if he abide in, my in, in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. We need to understand there is a direct connection to walking with God, having communion with God, and bearing fruit. You can't do it without him. I cannot bear true fruit in my life, good fruit in my life, unless I'm abiding in Messiah. Jesus came to do something. He came to reconnect us. What's well, interesting, in, in Genesis 3 and 8, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool evening. And the way it's, it's phrased in the Hebrew doesn't mean it was a sudden event. God says, I sense in the force that Adam and Eve has sinned. I better go down there and check it out. That, that, that's not conveyed in the language. What's conveyed in the language is every evening God would come and he would have communion with Adam and Eve. 
He would come and he would share with them. He would talk with them. Can you imagine the God of heaven and earth physically coming down and walking with you in the garden and that God is physically there that you can ask him anything? You want to talk about being able to have tapped into all knowledge. A-double-L, all knowledge. Adam had every evening. And as he walked with God, because evening was the beginning of the day, biblically, so at the beginning of the day, God would come down and walk with Adam to teach him and empower him to fill all the rest of that day with productivity, with fruitfulness. Because God was abiding with man. He lost it in the garden, and then Jesus comes, and he says, you want to start bearing fruit again the right way? Abide in me and let my words abide in you. If you do that, you will bear much fruit, and you will bear much fruit, not only for you to have joy, but for God to be glorified. God is glorified automatically in a believer's life when good fruit begins to be manifest. In fact, it's the primary way that God is glorified because it becomes a testimony. When you go from bad to good, when you go from wounded to whole, when you go from having no future to all of a sudden all this creativity and this blessing begins to flow from you, and they said, how did you get that? And you point back to an old rugged cross, and you begin to point back to Jesus walking with you, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because the price he paid, you have a new walk, that becomes a testimony. And see, we in the church haven't, haven't got that. In a lot of churches, won't you come to church and be miserable just like me? Won't you come to church and be occupy your time gossiping just like me? Now, we may call it prayer requests, but all it is is really gossiping because we're so miserable, the only way that we can feel better is to preoccupy ourselves with how more miserable everybody else is but us. Gossip is a toxin. Because what you're glorifying is bad seed. You're going to get that here in a minute. You're glorifying bad seed. But when God starts doing things in your life, you start talking about that. The other dims in comparison. Because what you start saying, man, if I could just get them to walk with God and to begin abiding in his word. I used to bear that kind of fruit, but now I'm bearing this new fruit, and this new fruit is really good. And if I can get them to walk in with the same God and aligning themselves with the same word, anybody, now it may be a different type of fruit, because, I mean, every one of us have different giftings, and those giftings produce fruit but it's always the fruit of God. And in that is wholeness. So even though you may be creative in a different area, we're not looking for cookie-cutter Christianity. We're looking for our uniqueness that is drawn out of and manifested and produced by God's life in us that if I can get them there, their miserability will stop. All the chaos in their lives will begin to stop. It may be a process, but they'll get to where there's more order than chaos. Wouldn't that be a blessing for some folks? It's interesting to me when you begin looking at major characters in the Word of God, they are always, these characters are characterized by walking with God. That communion. One was so phenomenal, it was repeated several times, and that's all we know about him. Enoch walked with God. Walked with God, Enoch did. He walked with God so great, God took him out. He produced so much fruit, this planet couldn't even hold him anymore. God says, you are so phenomenal because of your walk with me. I've got a task for you that's not going to happen until in the book of Revelation. So I'm going to take you out to bring you back because I already sense it because I know all and I see all. Nobody's up for the task except for you and Elijah. I mean, those, the, the world isn't going to know what hits it when those two boys show back up because of their walk with God. Abraham was called to 
walk with God. When Jesus showed up, he said to his disciples, come and follow me, come and walk with me. It's in the walking that the transformation happens because it's only in the walking can you abide in him. And when you abide in him, you will bear fruit. In the book of Genesis, man is told to bear fruit. In John, Jesus said, my disciples, they were told to bear fruit so that the Father might be glorified. In Genesis, man walked with God. In in John, they were called to walk, to abide in Jesus, to walk with Jesus. In Genesis, they were given commandments. Jesus said, if my word abides in you, what's God's word made up of? Commands that that have a blessing attached to them. Do this, you get this. I mean, if you plant if you plant corn, you're not going to get rutabagas. Even though probably Monsanto or some of these companies are trying. Come on now, if you plant this within you through the walk and through the word, because when you abide in the word, it's the same as abiding with God, because it's His thoughts all written down. It's the mind of Christ. Is this right here? And then the Holy Spirit comes to empower this right here. And as I stay and I abide and I meditate in it and learn how to do it, it begins producing fruit in my life. Genesis, man was commanded to be fruitful, produce fruit. Jesus commanded his disciples to bear much fruit. It's the same thing. Because Jesus said, I have come to, to, to get back, to seek out, and to save that which was lost. And we always think just man. He said, that which was lost, not who was lost. That which was lost. Mankind could be considered a that, couldn't they? When you, when you deal with mankind as a whole, it can become that. But he also came to get back man's authority. Man lost his authority in the garden. He gave it over to the devil. When Jesus rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave, he said, all authority has been given unto me. Why? Because when he was in the pit of hell and opened up a can of whoop devil on Lucifer, he got the keys. And he resurrected with authority. But he didn't stop there. Jesus went and got back the fruitfulness that man was supposed to have. The fruitfulness that man was supposed to have. Jesus resurrected from the dead and had fruitfulness for your life in the kingdom in his hands. Only when a man bides in God and becomes fruitful is God glorified in the earth. I don't know about you, but I I think heaven is probably just as tired of it as much as I am. I am tired of the world, in a sense, being more fruitful than the body of Christ. We're running around in chaos being goof troop because we won't abide any commandments. And we call it churchianity. And most of it is, is orchestrated chaos. As long as the money keeps coming in and we can pay the mortgage and we can build a big building to impress people. I would rather invest in building lives. Buildings can't produce fruit. Lives can. People ask the Apostle Paul, where's your documentation? I mean, only a Gentile could ask that. No Jew would have even asked that because he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's third, fourth generation Pharisee. He was trained in the school of Hillel. No Jew would have ever said, what are your credentials? The Gentiles did. And the Apostle Paul said, you are. It was through my ministry you came to faith in Messiah. You're my credentials. Isn't that weird your credentials are calling you to ask what your credentials are? They had missed the point. Paul was saying, you're the fruit. What God is doing in your life is the fruit of what I have sown. He was blessed. He had an encounter with Almighty God on the road to Damascus. Some people say Paul got saved there. I think Paul found his calling at the road to Damascus, and God clarified who he was. And he said, I'm gonna, I, I have spent my whole life working for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but now since I really found out who he is, I'm going to get in line with his purpose. And he said, you guys are my fruit. Paul could never point back to a building, could he? He pointed to people. And the true fruit of any real ministry is always what it does in the hearts of the people. You can have 10,000 show up that are all fruitless or manifesting the wrong fruit. And it's not a ministry. 
Not a biblical one. The biblical one, we need to be involved in calling people to Jesus and then seeing that they build a life that is biblical so that life can bear fruit. Now here's a quandary for us. We produce the fruit of what we abide with. We produce the fruit of what we abide with. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. You see, if your soil and the heart of mankind is soil, you were created to receive seed and to bear fruit just like the ground does. In fact, the Bible tells us to break up the fallow ground, the hard pan. But you know what I have discovered about weeds? Weeds you never have to till to cultivate. Do you know that? They'll grow up through concrete if you give them half a chance. They don't need to have follow. They don't need to have ground turned up. They'll, they'll take hard pan. The big old dandelion will grow up right in the middle of the biggest patch of hard pan. It takes a hammer to crack up, but that dandelion grew and nothing else will because it's a weed. God puts these things in nature to show us the reality of the two kinds of seed. One only grows when you cultivate it. The other grows. It, 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 it's, it's, it's almost like it's, if you don't do this and try to keep this out, this one will take over. And it's manifested by what our lives produce. In verse 16, and I'm going to read this out of the complete Jewish Bible because I, I, I believe it is just such a good translation here. It says, what I am saying is this, run your lives by the Spirit. Then you do not what your old nature wants. How many know your old nature is the sin nature? Your new nature is is the God kind of nature. The nature that only comes from God and abiding in Him. For the old nature wants what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit wants what is contrary to the old nature. These oppose each other. These oppose each other. In other words, the, natures, the nature and the seeds of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God oppose each other. Just like light will oppose darkness. They, they, one tries to crowd the other out. Can you see that here? Okay. These oppose each other so that you find yourselves unable to carry out your good intentions. But, I, like, I love it when God puts but in, in the word. But if you are led by the Spirit, then you are not in subjection to a system that results from the perverting the Torah into legalism. You see, that's another tactic of the enemy. If he can't get you not doing the commandments, he tries to render them from something that empowers to something that jails you up, that restricts you, that perverts what God wanted it for. It's like genetically modifying the seed. How many know in the kingdom no GMO is allowed? Don't you dare modify what Almighty God has given us. He goes on to say, and if it it is perfectly evident what the old nature does. It expresses itself, or this is the fruit of the old nature, in sexual immorality, in impurity, and in indecency, involved with the occult and with drugs, in feuding and fighting, become jealous and getting angry, in selfish ambitious and uh, factionalism, and intrigue and envy, in drunkenness and orgies, and things like these. And I warn you now, as I have warned you before, those who do such things will have no share in the kingdom of God. I like, the, I like this version because it puts an exclamation point there. That if you have this seed and the seed has taken over your life, you have no part in the kingdom of God. And yet we have churches that say everybody that does these things are welcome to come in. We're not going to ask you to change because there's grace. Yet the Apostle Paul says, if you do these things, you have no part of the kingdom of God. You see, when I'm encountered with grace, I change. I used to do these things, but now that I've encountered the grace of God, I don't do these things anymore. I am given a new nature. And yet we have a lot of church that gives no one a new nature. It just preaches an untransformational gospel. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, self-control. Nothing in the Torah stands against these things. Why not? Because the Torah is supposed to produce those things. And someone who has had their ground redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, I can begin receiving good seed, and that seed produces these things. Now, in the process of that, it can produce the blessing. But in me, this is characteristic of the fruit that I'm manifesting. Moreover, those who belong to the Messiah Yeshua have put their old nature to death on the stake along with its passions and desires. Since it is through the Spirit that we have life, let it also be through the Spirit we order our lives day by day. I like how he said order our lives because the only thing that can bring order is the commandments. And the Holy Spirit is here to make those commandments alive in us. You see what the Apostle Paul has done for us, he's outlined that there are two types of fruit in the earth. Two types of fruit. The first one, the flesh, is the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mankind was infused with its seed in the Garden of Eden. The second one, the spirit, is the fruit of the tree of life, Messiah. We are infused with its seed when we make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of our lives, and we discover who we are by the fruit we produce. Well, brother, then you're calling me to judge people. No, you examine the fruit. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 21. Guys, we're going to have to become discerning. Jesus said, there are many that are going to say that I am the Christ, and they're going to deceive many. Jesus went on to say, there are going to be many call me Lord, Lord, and I say, why haven't you done the things that I said? Get out. I don't know you. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty serious. There are a lot of people that call Jesus Lord that he doesn't know because their lives never produced the fruit of knowing him. If they knew him, he would know them. Because that word know is not, it doesn't cover the, the omniscience of God, that God knows everything. How many know God knew Hitler? But that didn't make Hitler his. But this word know is... There, there is, it's almost like a husband knows a wife. There is a level of intimacy there. If you're intimate with Christ, that's the abiding, and that abiding produces fruit. And he says, you call me Lord, but there's no fruit because you were never intimate with me. I've never known you. Verse 16, and ye shall know them by their fruit. Underline this in your Bible, and ye shall know them by their fruit. Not by how nutty they are. But by their fruit, you examine, you can, by examining a person's life, you can tell them who, you can tell who they were abiding with. Do men gather grapes of thorns and figs of thistles? So even every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hint is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruit you shall know them. He began that with that, and he ended it with that because that's significant. I don't care how many people call themselves a Christian. Their lives speak louder than their words. Think about that for a minute. Because if I call myself a Christian and my life manifests the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, I have made God's name vain in the earth. One of God's big ten. You know, I've heard people, you know, well, you know, when we, well, let's look at all the bad Jews. You know, we, we had Freud. <laughs> Hitler was half Jewish. We have Karl Marx. They try to bring those out. For every one of those, I can give you 10,000 bad Christians. They call themselves Christians. How many evils have been done in this world in the name of Christ by a church that never belonged to him? That rejected his commandments. That blent in paganism and, and added it to Jesus. Jesus again tells us this in Matthew 12, 33. Every, every 
tree or either make the fr the tree good and its and its fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and its fr and its fruit corrupt for the tree is known by his fruit the tree is known by his fruit i would rather find a man that quietly lives his faith and produces fruit than somebody that's all mouth and no fruit or the wrong fruit Guys, true believers are not known by what the church or denomination they belong to. True believers are known for the fruitfulness that manifests in their lives because they abide in God and in His Word. And I have known people in Christianity, and I have known people in the Messianic movement that all bore the wrong fruit. How I many that you can put a kippa and a talit? on a guy not walking, really walking with God who's become religious, and you can put a shofar in his hand and he'll still bear bad fruit. All you have done is you have taken the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and draped it with a talit, which seems to be an oxymoron. Because if you actually look about a talit, it's representative of who Messiah is. But yet we do it. We think what's on the outside is, and all these little trappings are going to make us the remnant of God. No, it just, it just makes you Jewish appearing bad fruit. Let me tell you something. The Jewish people have enough problems on their hands without a bunch of Gentiles dressing up as Jewish people bearing bad fruit. Don't add to their misery. <laughs> Instead, be there to assist them when they need it and pray for, pray for Jerusalem, pray for Israel, and walk in the ways of God. By doing that, you create a safe place that even, even a Jew that doesn't know who Messiah is, that creates a safe place for them to dwell. And, in, and at seeing that fruit, that Jewish heart will be drawn to the true fruit of God. Do you know that Jewish heart, people that, Jews that don't know Messiah, their hearts burn when true praise and worship is given by Christians? And I know this by personal testimony. When I was in the military, I argued with a guy for a year about who Jesus was, and none of it worked. He had an answer for everything. Then he came to one of our worship services. We didn't even hardly have any preaching that service. The whole thing was one of those ball gut cry because the presence of God is here. And I, at the end of it, he sat there with tears rolling down his face saying, Jesus is the Messiah. Why? He ate of the fruit. <laughs> A Jewish heart understands the fruit of life from the tree of life. Sometimes I Gentiles, you got a label with a big old label sticker on there and teach us, this is good fruit, this is good fruit, this is good fruit. Because half the time, we're calling bad fruit good fruit. But we need to understand there, there, there's, there's a principle that the fruit is produced by who you abide with. If we abide with the things of the world, you will always produce the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Regardless of your educational level, you will always produce that fruit. When I begin abiding with God, God begins to plow up the fallow ground, begins to, the wa washing of the water of the word begins to take away the old seed and begins to root up the old weeds and God begins to cultivate and be out of that relationship not religion, relationship, I can begin to produce good fruit. Understand the, understanding the concept of abiding is paramount for you to produce good, good fruit. How many of us have seen good kids begin to keep bad company and they got bad? They begin to have fellowship with darkness. Now you know why the Apostle Paul says, have no fellowship with darkness. Have no, have no fellowship with these things. Because if you do, you let weeds in your garden. I want to go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Now I'm going to give you a concept I have never, ever heard any minister ever give. And if they're out there, God bless them. I've just not run across their writings, okay? I do not claim to have anything original. I think like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. There are just those of us who hear. And so you can't take credit for what you heard, whether it's the Holy Spirit speaking it or another theologian. But I want, to, I want you to think about this for a minute. There is fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Okay? And yet the Christian is commanded to bear fruit, but that fruit comes from the tree of life. Now, here's, here's a paradox. All fruit contains seed. There is not a fruit on this planet that does not contain seed. You can start with one apple. You can end up with an apple tree that produces lots of apples. You can end up with a peach. You get one peach. You plant it. You can get a peach tree that bears many peaches. So any fruit has seed to replicate itself in mass. Makes sense, don't it? Okay. Now I want to I want to show you something here in Genesis three seventeen. And Adam and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And I actually think these are two separate statements. You know, it, it's interesting to me how, how theologians and Christians debate what was the fruit that Adam ate of the tree? It was an apple. It was a pomegranate. It was a fig. The new big thing is it was a fig. It was grapes. Some say because, you know, when he ate it, you know, the, the grape is the blood of the vine, and so man didn't have blood until he ate of the grape. The, that fruit doesn't matter. What matters is what was embedded in the fruit because we're talking about an ideology. We're talking about a way of living that was based in the fruit. You could have a person never eat any fruit their whole life, but yet eat of that fruit in sorrow every day. Why? Because you become the tree. What Adam, what he ate of that fruit, it changed what he did. It changed the way he thought. It, it, it separated him from God. And the seed, when, when he ate of that fruit, the seeds of it permeated his mind. And then he began to have branches of that fruit begin to hang off of him. And he began to eat of the own fruit that his life bared. Because Adam sinned. Abel died at the hands of Cain. That was actually the fruit of Adam's sin. Because his separation from God and the knowledge that he got from that tree was embedded in the way he thought, in the way he did things, in the way he lived, and it manifested everything shall produce after its own kind. And in Abel, the kind was the part of Adam that really wanted to walk with God. In Cain, it was, I will do it my way because I will be like a God. God better be satisfied with what I come up with. I don't have to abide by God's system. I don't have to abide by God's commands. Because of grace, he has to accept me just the way that I am. Tell that to Cain. We were created to bear fruit. And the fruit that man, that man bears is the product of what or who he has been abiding with. All fruit has a seed to reproduce itself. The seed is then sown into the lives of those around him in the earth, and it begins to replicate. Thus the reason why man will eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil all the days of his life is because the fruit is contained in his soul and that everything he produces with that knowledge is contains seed to replicate in others. That's why if a good kid hangs around bad kids, he comes under the influence. But you know what? You can take a bad kid and put him in the middle of kids of people walking with God and they start loving on him and praying on him and he finds Jesus and all of a sudden he begins to repent of all that bad fruit and that bad seed and then the seed of God's word begins to be sown in him and the next thing you know the bad kid becomes a good kid. But you can also take a Christian that used to bear good fruit and he quits hanging with those that walk with God and starts hanging with those that don't all the time and their seed will get sown into his heart. We call him a backslidden Christian. Jesus in, in his famous parable on the sower sows the word, the very first statement, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower, the sower sows the word. But you know that we're all sowers, both good and bad. 
Every man, every woman is a sower. You sow with what's in your heart. You either have the fruit of God in your heart and you begin sowing good seed, or you have the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil and you, and you begin sowing darkness into the hearts of men. Now the women I call their, their darkness light, they say you know, setting on fire the, uh, the souls of men are uh, I, I forgot exactly how they said it. It's, it's a phrase, Illumina. In fact, one of the, the librarians that was an Illuminist over, over Congress, the Library of Congress, wrote a book called Fire in the Minds of Men. And it actually goes back to a story or a novel written about rebellion and, upturn, and upturning in, in when, when Russia became communist and all the debauchery that went on with that. They called that fire in the hearts or the minds of men. It, it just takes... We, we can have one man walking with God that will inspire us and teach us the word because what God has sown in his heart, he can do it in a very simplistic manner. He doesn't have to wax eloquent because we have too many that have taken eloquence and wrapped it around the seed of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and preached it from pulpits and even call it the word. Because if you get up here and you preach from this, but you're not filled with this, you're going to sow darkness into the hearts of the people. That's why tomorrow in churches all over America, people are going to be preaching the word, so preaching, you know, that's why your favorite word can be the word. But it's full of the wrong seed. It's because you can only, that which your mind and your heart are connected to, that which you're drawing from, produces the seed. And you can actually say the right things from the pulpit, but your heart is sowing the wrong things all the time. That's why for a preacher, him making sure who he's abiding with is paramount. It's paramount. Because whether you're eloquent or whether you're simplistic in your delivery, it's the seed. It's the seed. All of us are sowing. Jesus in this parable, the sower sows the word. Guys, we all sow from the fruit that's produced in our lives. Jesus is speaking of a man sowing, but he, he also warns us of something. He says there's a system in the world wants to kill out God's seed and replace it with its own. This entire world system is contrary to the seed of God. That's why the Holy Spirit's got to work on somebody to receive the word, the seed of God. If the Holy Spirit's not there to break up the ground and to water it, it will never produce. All of the, all, if, if he's not there and he's not doing it because it's a true word, vile religion is the only thing that can spawn from it. But there are the, the, the knowledge, this one thing, God, I, I thought this was interesting. The, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a spiritual weed in the earth. It was only with the fall do thorns and thistles come. I just read that in Genesis. Thorns and thistles will fight you the whole time that you're trying to be productive, Adam. That there's good, and there are physical thorns and thistles in this world, and there are spiritual ones that are so much more powerful. And Jesus, when he said, listen, the sower goes forth to sow the word, and he said that there are, there are four things, four things that will come up against the word. Tribulation and persecution for the word's sake. To kill it before it takes root. Then he goes on to say the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth. That with wealth, if you're not walking with God, will deceive you and lead you into the wrong seed. And, why, and, and I, Mary and I sometimes were blown away by what we hear go on behind the scenes, supposedly, in a lot of the, the hallowed halls of Christianity and huge ministries. Every once in a while, some of the things will leak, and it will blow you away. You know why? Because it became a gospel of wealth. And with that, you open the door to deception, because if it's all about wealth instead of about God, how many of there's a lot of things money can't buy? Those are, the more, those are the most precious. Wealth in itself, biblical prosperity, is having whatever you need that God requires of you, whether it's giving or joy or health or, or, or whatever. It's not just about money, but we turned everything into an Americanized gospel. Since we became a consumer nation, the only way that we can consume is to have wealth. 
and therefore I walk with God by my ability to consume. That's really what's being preached. And it will choke out the word and it will produce weeds. And weeds are manifesting all over the body of Christ today. Because now I've got 10 acres of ground. And when we first got it, the guy that owned it before us had one of those big tractors that had a hedgehog or a bush hog on the back of it. I mean, you can mow down trees this big around in the hedgehog. I, I wish I had a hedgehog that had the munchies, you know. Get back there and get that stuff. Bush hog, too. Um, but he could go out there, and I mean, when you, can, when you can do a five or six foot swipe at a time, you can mow down 10 acres. And I mean, we had the whole back all done up, and it was done nice. And uh, then I come out there with my little 36-inch lawnmower, right lawnmower. I mean, no, I ain't gonna, I'm not going to be doing all that. And what I have found, uh, there's a part of my property that we can't even hardly even have a, a, a garden anymore because where we used to have a garden on the part that we don't mow has turned into a jungle. I swear I hear two cans and monkeys back there. I got vines big enough. I got my grandkids could swing on those vines in Missouri. And I'm thinking, it's a jungle. And I, I was just pondering about that. I said, God, what, what are you, why are you trying to teach me? Because my, my back lot doesn't look like this. That one area right there. Because you see it all the time. And God is saying, this is a Christian's life who doesn't keep their garden weeded. Because weeds you don't have to cultivate. The seeds of the world you do not have to cultivate. You got to fight. Because everything about this planet is about cultivating from the seeds of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you do, it always creates sorrow. No matter how grand the gesture, no matter the utopia, how many fascist governments have promised utopia that ended up being the most dismal, suppressive thing that could ever be put together. It's literally collapsing in on itself in Europe, and we're not that far behind it. Because unless it comes from the seeds of the knowledge of the kingdom of God, it will only produce sorrow. No matter the grand gestures that go with it, it will always create darkness. A weed is always a weed, no matter how pretty you might think that dandelion is. It is a weed, and the last thing you want is that kid, when that little puff gets up there, the last thing you want is the kid, that in the kid's hand, and it goes, Phew. I remember that commercial come on a couple years ago, this guy's working to get his yard all nice, and one little dandelion comes up, and his little daughter gets it, and as he, she's going, Phew. he's going, no! Because after that, it will be a constant fight. In your life, if you're not, a, there, there, there is a default setting, guys. If I'm not walking with God, breaking up the follow ground, de-weeding it and planting it out of that relationship with God, receiving his word and keeping his commandments, I by default give my ground, my life over to the weeds. the thorns and the thistles that bring sorrow because no matter I mean you, you can take it and you can wrap it up in great gestures and you, you can take it and make great halls of philosophy that sound so lofty but they're not lofty they're drawn from the pits of hell and they only destroy men and choke out the true ways of God because it all comes down to seed and who you're abiding with And if you start abiding with God and abiding with other believers, that's, that's the power of true community. Is I'm really careful about who I really have fellowship with. Because if they're not walking with God, I don't need those weeds in my garden. What I try to do is say, why don't you take a bite of this and see, this tastes different, this produces different, this doesn't kill you. Maybe it'll get you hungry. See this fruit. I'm not miserable like you all the time. I'm not scared all the time. Uh, uh, I'm not always this worried about the past. You know what? When you let God give you new fruit, you can overcome the past because the past are the weeds that need to get plowed out. I am no longer a product of my past. I am a product of God who gives me a future. But you got to understand, it's time to get out the weed killer. 
It's time to say, who am I really abiding in? What, 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 is, the, what is the predominant thought in my life? Are, are it thoughts that are produced by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or are it the thoughts that are produced by abiding in Christ and, and the Word of God? Because if I can get established, that's why the Apostle Paul says, think on these things. Think on these things. It's not living in Pollyanna you know, poly land. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about be careful what is sown into your heart and into your life and what you meditate on because what you receive and you meditate on, you will reproduce. And we were called, man has a command of being fruitful. And it can either be used for Satan or it can be used for God. But that basic command still remains upon man, and Satan took advantage of it in the garden. Now it's time to let God take advantage of it and abide in him and abide in his word. Father, we just ask you this morning that you would give us grace. Father, we sang that song as we ended praise and worship. Stay, Father, that we're, we're tired of breaking your heart by walking away because we allow the seeds of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to pull us away. But, Father, right now, we just condemn those seeds. Father, we rebuke them. Father, we plead the blood of Jesus over every seed the enemy has ever planted in our lives. Father, we bring down this morning every high thought that tries to exalt itself against your word. And, Father, we rip those things up by the root. And we ask that every day that you would give us the grace to go weeding and to till up the ground to prepare it for the Holy Spirit to begin speaking in our lives. Father, let us daily walk with you in the cool of the evening. Father, let us have that season, that window of opportunity that we have each day to hear your voice and to walk with you so that as we fellowship with you and fellowship with your word, that you begin sowing new seeds, seeds of the tree of life into our lives because Messiah now owns that ground because we have been bought with a price. And our very lives, our very bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And let it be illuminated by His light and His light alone, we ask in Jesus' name.